we are very, very pleased tonight to have with us uh, Dr. Eugene Callens, who has, is eminently well qualified to address this particular matter of uh, Soviet strength and our vulnerability, because that's basically the premise we're going to address tonight. Uh, Gene is a professor of mechanical engineering at Louisiana Tech University. Prior to joining the tech faculty in 1983, he was an engineering manager with CalSpan Field Services at the Arnold Engineering and Development Center in Tullahoma, Tennessee. Tullahoma? Yeah. Uh, okay. The reason I'm reading this is there's a lot of information here, and I think it's really relevant that you hear it, so excuse me for reading. He received a bachelor and master's degrees in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech, a diploma with honors from the von Karman Institute of Fluid Dynamics in Belgium, and a PhD, PhD degree from the University of Tennessee Space Institute. He was awarded the von Karman Prize in 1967 for outstanding research in the field of fluid dynamics and the General H. H. Arnold Award in 1974 in recognition of his outstanding contributions to the aerospace sciences. During 1984, he received the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, Outstanding Section Award on behalf of the Tennessee section, which he chaired during the 1982-83 and an AIAA Space Shuttle Award. Dr. Callens is currently a distinguished lecturer for AIAA on the subject of the Soviet nuclear challenge. He is the author of numerous technical publications a member of many honorary and professional societies, a registered professional engineer, and a consultant to aerospace companies. He's served in many positions of leadership within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, including branch president, district president, and the Chattanooga stake president. He is currently a regional representative of the church with responsibility for the church organizations in Little Rock, Memphis, Nashville, and Knoxville regions. He's a native of Savannah, Tennessee, and we don't hold that against him. He is, <laughs> he is married to the former Barbara Ann Brochette, Brochette of Covington, Louisiana, which, by the way, she is here tonight. They are the parents of 10 children, ranging in ages from 26 to four years, including eight of their own and two foster children. And they also have three grandchildren. I would like to present to you for the remainder of the evening, basically, Dr. Gene Callens. Thank you, Lieutenant Clayton. May I share with you uh, at the outset of this presentation, uh, as a brief introduction, how I really got involved in the area of uh, strategic analysis. Uh, Loretta Duncan, who uh, led us in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, and her husband, Herb, were in Belgium uh, about 20 years ago when uh, Barbara and I and the family were there when I was studying at the Von Karman Institute. When I came back from there, uh, I went to Georgia Tech for a short while, and then I went to work at the Arnold Engineering Development Center in Tullahoma, Tennessee, as Gary has said. And I was there uh, over many years while uh, Crescent Kearney was at uh, Oak Ridge. During that time, as, in fact, when I went to work there, I was a research engineer in the aeroballistics branch of the von Karman facility. Now, those facilities dealt with the development of advanced re-entry vehicle systems, nose tips, heat shields, so forth. Eventually, I managed those facilities. Virtually all the programs that we worked on were classified programs, classified secret. They were the advanced programs that were uh, going to be operational 20, 30 years down the road, perhaps. And during that time, I had the opportunity of attending many classified meetings. And there will be obviously no classified information given here tonight, but much of the information that I will give you tonight was in fact classified at that time. It has been declassified since then because of the seriousness of the situation. In those meetings that I was attending, the, as the, anal the analysts who would be there were virtually unanimous in their results of their studies that showed that if the United States continued the way it was developing or not developing strategic weapon systems at that time, and if the Soviet Union continued their current buildup, that by the early and mid 80s, there would develop a period of time that they referred to as the window of vulnerability. A time when they said that it would be possible for the Soviet Union to launch a surprise attack against the United States 
and eliminate or greatly reduce our capability of responding to that attack, which would mean that mutually assured destruction would no longer be viable because we could not assure the destruction of those things that were most important to the Soviet Union. Well, having, I became very interested in that particular topic and having access to the right data, began to enlarge my own studies from particular systems that I was working on to the broader uh, subject of uh, systems and policy analysis, uh, strategic analysis. And so since that time, for, it's been a period now of close to 20 years, uh, I have intensely studied that subject. And I, I want to emphasize to you that the, that the view that is expressed here is virtually unanimous among the analysts, uh, the people who really have their hands on the data and are uh, making these kinds of calculations. And in order to illustrate that, I would like to begin with a series of quotes. Quotes from people that I think that you will recognize, most of them. People who have been in the position to make these types of evaluations. Now, this is a very important point. The issues that we are dealing with deal with a lot of very highly classified information. And not everybody is in a position to make these evaluations. But there are many that are. That is, they have access to the data. And you will see from those that are in very highly placed positions that, in fact, they have come to identically the same uh, conclusions. I'd like to begin with a quote from Gene Kirkpatrick, who, uh, as you're aware, is our former ambassador to the United Nations. She made this particular quote uh, in January of last year. The most important development in international relations in 1985 was the growing vulnerability of the United States. American vulnerability is so new, so inconsistent with our history and our expectations that we find it nearly impossible to believe to remember or to cope with. Now that last uh, phrase is particularly important. We find it nearly impossible to believe, to remember, or to cope with. And that is a very serious problem in having the American people understand what the issue really is in this time. Because, uh, as she points out, it is so inconsistent with all the things that we have known in the past. Dr. Robert Jastrow is the founder and former director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He's currently a professor at Dartmouth, and he is now the head of the George C. Marshall Institute, which is an institute because of uh, his concern about uh, these particular matters, has been pressing for early deployment of SDI. And he's been supplying a lot of information to the Reagan administration. You may have seen references to them in the, uh, in the news media. He said in August of 1985, because of the Soviet missile buildup, and the resultant threat to our retaliatory forces. The whole theory of mutually assured destruction is collapsing like a house of cards. If the Soviets have a sufficient number of accurate missiles to wipe out our own nuclear forces in a surprise attack, they will not be deterred by the fear of retaliation because we will not be able to retaliate. This is just what has happened. As a result, this nation faces the greatest peril it has ever known. Now again, Dr. Dr. Jastrow is one of the most respected physicists in this uh, nation today. Dr. George Keyworth, formerly President Reagan's science advisor, said in September of that same year, after explaining that 15 years ago we had a creditable deterrent, and then he said that was 15 years ago. Today, the Soviet Union has concentrated its nuclear firepower in a massive modern ICBM force that is optimized for use in a preemptive strike against us. In fact, if we were struck without warning by a Soviet preemptive attack, it is possible that 90% of our own ICBMs would be destroyed, that most, if not all, of our bombers would be gone, and that more than half of our strategic submarine fleet would be sunk in port. Now, he's really talking about a period of 30 minutes, by the way, in which all of that would occur. That is the reality of the environment in which we live. Now, again, you're talking about the science advisor. Again, the man who has access to the data and who is, who is able to make these kind of judgments. I point, your, point out to you the words that is optimized for use in a preemptive strike against us. That is very important to realize. It isn't that they built a force and they could use it in this mode. They built it for this purpose. Will they use it for this purpose? Well, I don't know. But we do know that they have built it and optimized it for this purpose. Secretary Weinberger and Secretary Schultz published a document in October of that same year, 85, called uh, Soviet strategic defense programs in which they point out the following. Soviet military doctrine and strategy call for superior offensive forces capable of executing a successful first strike. 
Again, the point is, it is doctrine and strategy, exactly reversed from the United States. We have no doctrine or no strategy to ever strike them first. Our policy is deterrence. Their policy is to strike first. Perhaps even more troubling, he says, is the fact that the USSR's offensive nuclear force buildup continues unabated with a large number of new systems at or nearing deployment. And that continues right to the very moment. Secretary Weinberger publishes an annual publication called Soviet Military Power. In the 1985 edition, in a section uh, called Restoring the Nuclear Balance, he said the following, the decade of the 1970s, marked by the massive Soviet military buildup, while the United States maintained a virtually static posture, left our nation in a clearly disadvantageous position. This dangerous shift in the global balance unmistakably demonstrated Soviet intentions to attain a position of military superiority. He further says, should this trend continue unchecked, one must assume, given Soviet writings, force deployments, and strategic force exercises, and I'll refer to all of those uh, a little later. Those are very important ways that we analyze uh, what the Soviets may be doing. The Soviet leadership could conclude that they had acquired the capability to fight and win a nuclear war. Such initiatives as their development of a potential first strike force of SS-18s and SS-19s, their plans to reload ICBM silos, and the extensive hardening and dispersal programs designed to protect their key assets provide clear indications of this Soviet attitude. Dr. Jastrow again, writing in February of this year, said little would be left of our nuclear forces for retaliation in the aftermath of a Soviet first strike. Destruction of United States military communication links would further diminish the effectiveness of the United States response. Against the ragged retaliatory strike the U.S. could launch after such an attack, the Soviet ABM defenses now under construction would be very effective. General Daniel Graham is a former deputy director of CIA, and he was later head of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. And again, I point that out because of the access to the right information that he has. In February of this year, made the following quote. The Soviet Union can credibly threaten a first strike to decapitate the United States military capability today. And we cannot do anything about it. This great country of ours today stands utterly defenseless against the danger of an annihilating nuclear attack. Yet the polls indicate that at least 60% of our citizens are unaware of the nation's vulnerability. Admiral Crow is currently the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Last year, as he presented the budget and then went before the Arm, uh, Senate Armed Services Committee to defend that budget, he gave uh, some uh, considerable detail in the enormity of the Soviet threat that we face. And then when he concluded his testimony to the members of the, of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, he said these words, whatever you decide, let it be based on a full and unemotional appreciation of the peril we face. These threats cannot be assumed away nor is it necessary to overstate them. They are impressive and ominous in their own right. There was a study conducted under the Defense and Strategic Studies Program at the University of Southern California. The two men conducting this study published their results in a book called Soviet Military Supremacy. And in that they say, the Soviets have far surpassed our country in military power and already have achieved overwhelming military superiority over the United States which may soon prove decisive, a superiority whose details are almost completely unknown to the American people. Stephen Daskal is a defense research specialist in Washington. In April of last year, in an article he wrote on this subject, he said, without warning, a significant portion of our retaliatory force could be destroyed before it is deployed. The Soviets know first strike success depends heavily upon surprise, and they are probably developing, or have developed, sufficient forces and security measures to attack without tipping off the United States. He further pointed out that many Americans, especially civilians with little exposure to or faith in intelligence estimates, cannot accept the possibility of an unprovoked strategic attack by the Soviets. Rejecting the possibility of nuclear war may be comforting and helpful for normal existence, 
but he says this societal self-delusion may prove a fatal liability. He referred to it, incidentally, as the Pearl Harbor Syndrome. That is just the, the, re the refusal to believe what is really a very scientific analysis, not a philosophy matter. Uh, it, it is not a matter of opinion. It is simply a matter of what the actual data say, a very firm and provable, demonstrable data. Senator Goldwater, uh, in his own characteristic way, made a statement in March the 5th of 82 that said, we're not just a little bit behind the Russians, we are devastatingly behind them. Major uh, General George Keegan Jr., uh, now retired but former Chief of Intelligence of the United States Air Force, said the Soviet Union is now in a position to launch, win, and survive World War III, and with fewer casualties than it suffered in the last World War. And incidentally, as we do that analysis, uh, that situation with those kind of casualties is uh, the worst case for them. The best case is where they take almost no casualties. That is, they have it within their capability now, if things went well, to where they would take almost no casualties. Now, I told you that I'd become concerned about this about 10 or 12 years ago. I wasn't the only one that was concerned about it, uh, Crescent Carney and many, many others. And there were many people at very high levels, again, from uh, both political parties, uh, liberals and conservatives, who had recognized the situation and were concerned. They formed a committee at that time called the Committee on the Present Danger, the present danger being this danger that we're speaking of tonight. Uh, a bipartisan committee whose purpose was to simply get information to the American people. They had published the results of their studies uh, in a book called Alerting America, the Papers of the Committee on the Present Danger. Notice here that the introduction is by Max Kappelman. As you know, he is our chief negotiator in Geneva today. There, were, there are 60 members of the Reagan administration, including, including President Reagan himself, that are members of this, this closed committee. That is, they have 141 members and they have not uh, grown. They've, they've held it to a small number uh, intentionally. Uh, Secretary Schultz uh, was a charter member of that committee, as uh, Gene Kirkpatrick and many, many others. Uh, I would uh, draw your attention to their particular papers because uh, they're saying exactly the same thing. And in fact, one of their most, more recent publications is Can America Catch Up? And their conclusion is yes, but not at the rate we're going because it had been a realistic question as to whether is it just absolutely too late? Can we catch up at all, no matter what we do? And their response was that yes, under certain circumstances, we could in fact catch up. Dr. Jastrow in February of this year sort of summarized it all in saying, the bottom line is that the Soviet Union is developing a lethal combination of a first strike attack force and a defense against retaliation by US ballistic missiles. That combination removes the ability of the United States to protect its citizens from nuclear attack. If Soviet plans come to fruition and the Soviet's nationwide ABM defense is deployed, the United States will have suffered the greatest military reversal in its history with highly destructive consequences certain to follow. Again, from one of America's leading, most respected scientists. Now let me uh, review with you a few moments. What are the elements of our vulnerability that have so concerned this broad spectrum of, uh, of uh, analysts. And they are the, the three principal elements of, U of U.S. vulnerability. Number one is the Command, Control, Communications, and Intelligence Network, CQDI. Now these are the satellites that are in orbit, the ground base stations that receive the information and transmit it to the National Command Authorities, and those same communi those communication links that connect the National Command Authorities to the missile silos, to the SAC bomber bases, and to the submarines that are on station uh, in the ocean. So if you could knock that out, if you could prevent the National Command Authorities from communicating with uh, these forces in the field, clearly we could not retaliate. So it, it is obvious that they have keyed uh, any such attack against those particular type targets. The second element of our vulnerability are the National Command Authorities themselves. Now, in peacetime, that consists of two people, the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense. They have two types of codes that they must transmit in order to release our nuclear response. The first is the, uh, what are called the enabling codes, sometimes known as the launch codes. Those are the codes that actually give the information that has to go into the computers that control the launch. Without that, no commander has the ability to uh, launch his missiles. That is, as the commanders said in the launch control centers near our silos today, they cannot launch those missiles. They do not have the capability of doing it. 
That's because they lack the launch codes. They must have those codes to put those in, and then that will, that will release the, or allow the missiles now to be fired. The second type of command that they, they must receive is an emergency action message, which is the actual command now to launch or to proceed according to a prearranged plan. So it's those two that must be communicated. Now, we have maintained central control of those facilities for a very important reason. It's extremely dangerous in the world to go around with uh, field commanders having control of the nuclear weapons. So we have, we have been very centralized in that. And this has been true that no field commanders have had the launch codes up until the Reagan administration. And President Reagan has given the submarine commanders the launch codes. And that, by the way, was revealed by an admiral appearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee. And the purpose of his saying that, of course, was to let the Soviets know it. Because we don't want to fight a war with the Soviets. We want to deter them. So if you make a move that where you're trying to deter them, you've got to tell them about it, or, or it will be of no value to you. Well, this admiral then said that before the committee so that they would know that. Now, it, it, what it illustrates, though, is how dangerous the situation is. We would never give a launch codes to the submarine commanders unless... Uh, it was determined that we were in a particularly dangerous situation. Number three, the third element of U.S. vulnerability, are the strategic nuclear forces themselves, bombers, cruise missiles, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the submarine-launched ballistic, ballistic missiles. Now, I would like to cover each of these vulnerabilities briefly, uh, along with the issues that we're concerned with regarding these vulnerabilities. But before I do that, let me, let me say what I'm talking about when we talk about a first strike. There's a great misconception in this country that a Soviet attack would be an absolute all-out attack, destroying the cities, destroying our industrial base, and so forth. And there are many who live here locally, for example, that feel that your steel companies and others would be the object of an immediate strike. That simply is not true. We know what the Soviet strategic doctrine is. We know what our own is. Neither we nor they are targeted on those kinds of targets. And the reason for that is very straightforward. Uh, there are reasons for it. There are many. One, you do not want to do global damage. That is, they do not want to do global damage. They don't want to hurt themselves in the process. Two, it doesn't make any sense to destroy populations. What they want to, the kind of attack they want to have is called a counter-force attack. That is, they want to attack our forces, not our cities, people, uh, the industrial base, so forth. What they would like to do is to eliminate these three classes of targets that I have just listed for you. They would like to eliminate our CQ guy, our national command authorities, perhaps, and also the strategic nuclear forces themselves. Without those, we could not respond against the Soviet Union. That is, in a nuclear age, when there is simply one strategic nuclear power, he has all the cards. If we tried to use our ground forces or our aircraft carriers or our tactical aircraft or anything, he could easily destroy our cities and there would be nothing we could do about it. Under such circumstances, it would complete, be completely untenable for the president to go on. They know that. Now that is called by the analysts decapitation. That is, you don't, have to, you don't need to destroy the country, you simply need to decapitate him. That is the danger. That has been the danger for a long time. It is not destruction is the danger, it is defeat. Now, an attack such as that against those classes of targets, incidentally, would, would still kill a lot of Americans. Approximately 20 million, we estimate. But there would still be 230 million that are alive and in fact are not going to die. There will be very few of them if they have a little basic knowledge, like Crescent Kearney has in his book, can, can easily and readily survive. And in fact, a recent study just in the last few weeks from MIT pointed out that residual radiation is not the problem after such an attack. It is, in fact, starvation is the problem. Well, let me deal with uh, each one of these vulnerabilities. First of all, the CQ dipolar. Now again, let me remind you that's command, control, communications, and intelligence. A principal issue here is the electromagnetic pulse. It is a grave concern to us that if the Soviets were to detonate a single weapon at an altitude of like 250 miles, now understand that's well outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, this isn't space. This is where they routinely have photo recon satellites. If they had on board one of those satellites, a very large nuclear weapon like 50, 60 megatons and detonated it, it is estimated that the electromagnetic pulse that it would generate would knock out, destroy every unprotected integrated circuit in America. Now what that means is all of the electronic equipment that we have, which is virtually all has 
uh, integrated circuits on it would be destroyed in an instant. I would like to uh, share with you some direct quotes on that because I think it is interesting to see what the, what the specialists uh, have said about that. Eric Lerner, in an article uh, he published in August of 1984 called Mushrooming Vulnerability to EMP, said the following, the EMP from a single hydrogen bomb exploded 300 kilometers over the heart of the United States, could set up electrical fields 50,000 volts per meter strong over nearly all of North America. Since the smaller the circuit, the more vulnerable to EMP. Even at the current degree of microminiaturization, almost every unprotected chip in the country, whether in missiles, aircraft, or communication centers, could be destroyed. Now what this is, let me give just a brief explanation of it. When the, when the bomb explodes, there is a, a, a very large amount of gamma radiation that is emitted. That gamma radiation reacts with the ionosphere and it creates uh, electrons called Compton's electrons which spiral in to the Earth's atmosphere and react with the, magnetic, the Earth's magnetic field. These electrons then set up, uh, what, what it is like is a big sheet of lightning. You can think of it as just a large sheet descending over all of North America, all of the area that's in line of sight of the explosion. And when any of these, uh, this sheet of electrons touches a conductor, the conductor picks it up and conducts it into the electronic equipment, which means that all of the miles and miles and miles of lines that come into this building would conduct that voltage into the building. Now it's cumulative. Notice that the quote says 50,000 volts per meter. That is about every three feet, you've got 50,000 volts. So over miles of that line, it's cumulative. You have got literally hundreds of millions of volts coming in uh, in a pulse. Now the pulse is a very short duration. It's about 10 nanoseconds. A nanosecond is 10 to the minus 9, so very short duration. That's why it doesn't kill people. But what it does do is to destroy integrated circuits. That is, it completely melts them. So it would be not a matter of simply throwing a relay and you're back, on, you're back in business. We would be out for a long time. Think of the effect just on the civilian economy, uh, let alone the military, uh, if this were uh, to happen. Well, in that same article, uh, Mr. Lerner went on to say, military communications are especially vulnerable. In 1980, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General David Jones, reported to Congress that in the first few seconds after an EMP attack, there would be widespread loss of connectivity in the communications grid. The power grid and telephone lines would pick up EMP and conduct it to all unprotected electronic equipment, destroying in an instant tens of billions of dollars worth of communications equipment and other electronics. And then he says, almost all electric power would be knocked out. Dr. Ashton Carter, formerly of MIT, and he was at MIT when he wrote this article, and he is currently at Harvard University, uh, in his article explained that uh, much of this information on EMP was classified until only a few short years ago. And uh, the reason that it was declassified was the need to alert the American public to the circumstances that, that exist there. And, and then with this background, he said the following. Consequently, in recent years, analysts have explicated the C cubed I problem in lurid detail, even putting forth a number of alarming possibilities. The United States is a paper tiger that could not in fact retaliate after a nuclear attack, since the command structure could be decapitated. Reliance on a strategy of launch under attack for ICBMs could invite disaster if warning uh, sensors mistakenly indicated a Soviet attack. By the way, he was answering the question, people say, why don't we go to launch under attack uh, with our ICBMs. And every president has considered that and every president has rejected it because it is so difficult to maintain control. And then he said elect electromagnetic pulse effects could disrupt so much electronic equipment that most communications and computer systems simply would not work. Then in, in sort of a, a summary of that particular position, Dr. Carter says, the many potential vulnerabilities of the CQI systems for the support of strategic nuclear forces demonstrate that it is difficult to guarantee that the United States could carry out the most rudimentary aspect of its nuclear deterrent policy, to discern the nature of an attack by the USSR and to retaliate according to a prearranged plan. Now probably the, the leading specialist on the EMP problem is, uh, in this country is Dr. Bruce Blair. He's at the Brook Brookings Institute. He was commissioned to do a two-year top secret study uh, for Congress. Uh, through the, the Office of Technology Assessment, which is a congressional arm. He conducted that study, and then he turned the results over to uh, OTA, and they had a blue ribbon uh, committee evaluate the report. 
Now, the, uh, the report uh, on this particular subject that appeared in the Wall Street Journal said that members of that committee became frightened when they read the report. And as a matter of fact, the chairman of the committee, who was the president of the University of Maryland, brought it to the attention of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I don't know what, can't know for sure what happened after that, but he obviously brought it to the attention of President Reagan because within just a few days, the classification on that report was increased from top secret to SIOP-ESI, which stands for Single Integrated Operating Plan Extremely Sensitive Information. Only four people had access to the report. The President, the uh, Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Now, the reason this made the Wall Street Journal was that the author himself, Bruce Blair, didn't have that classification. He only had top secret, so he didn't have access to the report anymore. And the press thought that was, that that was unusual, and so the, uh, the headlines uh, to this article read something like, uh, author cannot even see his own report. And then they detail what I just said to you. Now, what we, they missed the point, though, is why was that report of such extreme concern to those men who are in the position to make this evaluation? Well, Dr. Blair published an unclassified version of that report. And, and I would like uh, to uh, share with you what he said in the unclassified version. Now, that version is called a Strategic Command and Control, Redefining the Nuclear Threat. He said, unless remitted, this vulnerability, EMP, leaves the United States without creditable responses to limited nuclear attack. Now, again, I point out to you that here is the, the leading authority in the United States having access to the data, making that judgment. Then, in, in another section, we're talking about the EMP, he said, an average voltage surge due to EMP exceeds the damage threshold of computers by a factor of 40. Now, I would like to uh, return to the vulnerabilities. The, uh, under the CQ die, I also had SGEMP. That stands for System Generated Electromagnetic Pulse. That's the mechanism by which the satellites are destroyed. And that's a similar mechanism to the EMP. I will not go into the details of that, but just suffice it to say that those satellites that are in direct line of sight of the explosion are also incapacitated by the same mechanism. The next vulnerability I mentioned is the National Command Authorities. One big issue is their survivability. The two men I mentioned, the President of the United States and Secretary of Defense, commonly reside in Washington. We have no ABM defense of Washington. In fact, we have uh, virtually no defense at all. There are Soviet uh, nuclear submarines carrying ballistic missiles that come within three minutes ballistic missile flight time of the heart of Washington. Now, we have excellent detection techniques. We know that they are there. But the difficulty is, if they launch, there is nothing we can do about it. We have no means of stopping the missiles at all, which means three minutes later, they will detonate over Washington if they're targeted on Washington. That is simply not enough time to get the President, Secretary of Defense, or anyone else to safety. So they could, they could prevent the launch codes from being transferred by killing the National Command Authorities. Now, we have plans, very super secret plans that I don't have access to, for transferring that authority. Now, uh, that, there are 16 people in the line, each one of these lines. That is, it goes from the president to the vice president, from the uh, secretary of defense to the deputy secretary of defense, and it goes right on down the lines. So those, uh, the control of the launch codes can be transferred. But the difficulty is that you have got to uh, verify that the national command authorities are dead, and go through this, this procedure, which takes time, to transfer that, uh, that command authority. And as we do the analyses of that, there simply is not enough time. That is, they could initiate and conclude such an attack before we could ever uh, be able to transfer uh, this command to, to the other men or women uh, below them. And some of them are women, by the way, because in that 16 line, there are, there are cabinet officials uh, that are there, that are in that line, and as a matter of fact, uh, could have that responsibility upon their shoulders. The next issue is that of release time. What if, in fact, the president survives? Maybe they will intentionally not hit the president because they want to have somebody to negotiate with. What if the communication systems works and he gets the information in? How long does it take to discern the nature of a Soviet attack and to determine what we are going to do? Think of the president being awakened in the middle of the night, for example, and he has got to very quickly make those decisions. Well, as we do the studies, there simply isn't enough time. Isn't enough time to to uh, respond, and we don't want to necessarily just launch everything we've got uh, to determine the nature of that attack and, and to respond. That's the nature of what we're up against in this day and time. Now, with the strategic nuclear forces themselves, survivability is a major issue. Now, remember in our triad of deterrence, there are three major uh, legs to that. One, of course, is the bombers. Now, the studies show 
that in fact the B-52s, most of the B-52s will never get out of sight of their bases. That is, if the Soviets launch from submarines positioned off the east and west coast of the United States, the, the targets, those SAC bases they're targeted on, will be hit before the bombers can get sufficiently far away from the bases. Now, I want you to know I say that before SAC bomber crews, and they do not disagree with that because they, they know that it is a valid analysis. Now, we're trying to remedy that. The B-1B is based at internal bases inside the United States. It has the capability to get up and get away much quicker than the B-52 does. We are hoping that uh, as we have full deployment of the B-1B, that we can remedy that. But right now, there, ha there is a major problem with survivability of the, of the bombers. Likewise, the uh, ICBMs are in an ident identical situation regarding survivability. When you calculate the single shot kill probability of a warhead from an SS-18 Mod 4, which is the Soviets' front line of missiles that they have developed to destroy Minuteman, when you calculate what is the probability that a single warhead will destroy a Minuteman 3, that number is 99.85%, virtually assured destruction. What it means is, as Dr. George Keyworth, the science advisor to the president, said in an earlier quote, we will lose virtually all of them in that initial attack. Now, we have no policy of launch under attack. We have determined, as I mentioned before, that that is too dangerous. Therefore, our policy is and always have been that, we, that the ICBMs will try to ride out the attack. And in the 60s, that was a good policy, by the way, because the Soviet accuracy was so poor that they could not hit them to knock them out. Now they can't. And so, consequently, we'll lose them all. When you look at the, uh, the submarines, now we have approximately 38 nuclear submarines that carry ballistic missiles. Only about 15 or less of those are under the ocean at any given time. Those that are, that are either at port or on top of the ocean someplace will be destroyed immediately. They carry so many warheads, the Soviets will have them targeted from others of their submarines, and they will destroy them within the first few seconds or minutes of such an attack. Those that are under the ocean do carry a lot of nuclear warheads. But, but let me share with you something that many people in the United States do not realize. The, our submarines carry very small yield warheads, and they do that intentionally, by the way. It was a part of our, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction that we would not threaten uh, uh, targets in the, in the Soviet Union such that it might be uh, interpreted as a first strike capability. So when we developed those missiles, we developed them with small warheads and uh, with less accuracy than what we could have put on them. Now, for example, the Poseidon has 50 kilotons. It carries warheads with 50 kilotons. The, um, uh, the Trident carries warheads with 100 kilotons. With the accuracies those, those systems have, they cannot destroy any hardened targets in the Soviet Union. Now, by hardened, I mean enough concrete and steel to resist very high overpressures. For example, the Soviets have hardened many of their silos and command centers to perhaps as great as 50,000 PSI overpressure. You compare that to the Minuteman III, about 3,000 PSI overpressure. You can see they have a significant advantage. In other words, they have taken those targets out from under our nuclear umbrella. We simply could not destroy them. They are invulnerable in that regard. We are highly vulnerable. That is an extremely dangerous situation, of course. Cruise missiles. Uh, the Soviets have been very concerned about the cruise missiles. Now, realize what the cruise missile is. That is a subsonic missile with a very low yield warhead, lower than any of those I've talked about, that uh, flies low, uh, tries to avoid defenses. But realize that's also the same kind of weapon that the Germans used against the British in World War II. The V-1 rocket was a cruise missile. And the British successfully knocked down 97% of all V-1s fired at them. They did that with Spitfires, which only had about half the speed of the missiles they were going after. Now, the Russians have the MiG-31 Foxhound, for example, which has twice the speed of the missiles they're going after. Let me show a picture of it. And you see the, uh, the missiles underneath this aircraft are AA-9 missiles that are specifically designed to hit targets like cruise missiles and aircraft. This, this aircraft has a look-down, shoot-down capability, which means that as it flies at high altitudes, its radars can look down, pick out targets, and fire and destroy them. They have that look-down, shoot-down capability now on this MiG-31, on the MiG-29, and on the Su-27. They have been rapidly deploying it. We know that the look-down, shoot-down capability is a good one because they stole it from us, from our F-18. They, they are able with that, and now they now have enough missiles deployed that they could destroy every cruise missile that we have before they get to their targets. Now think about the situation that they've got. We're never going to attack them first. They never even worry about that. They're going to attack first if it happens, and they know when they're going to attack. They know what targets we, we will be interested in, therefore what they've got to defend. 
So they only have to defend a certain area over a very limited period of time. That is, they can have all their aircraft in the air because we either have to use what cruise missiles that we might have available or lose them right away. So consequently, they as the aggressor would have a, a uh, absolutely overwhelming advantage in that situation. The, the, um, the next issue uh, I'd like to discuss is that of penetrability. Secretary Weinberger has said openly that the B-52s cannot penetrate Soviet airspace. That is, the electronic countermeasures that we have on there cannot penetrate the sophisticated Soviet air defenses, even though I realize a Cessna did it not long ago. But had he been a B-52, he would have had a little bit more problem than he had in getting in there. Now, not only that, those aircraft, you realize, are over 30 years old. And not only that, even though we've upgraded the systems on them many times, uh, many of the systems on them are very, very old. And it is a fact that the mean time between failures of the systems that we carry on board is less than the time it takes to get to the Soviet Union. That is, the probability that the aircraft can actually get there with all of their systems intact is very low if they encounter no Soviet defenses. And again, that's widely acknowledged and accepted within the Strategic Air Command. It is an extremely serious problem. So penetrating Soviet airspace and getting to the targets uh, is, uh, is, again, a very big question. Some of the analyses has shown that under the best circumstances, the Soviets would not take a single nuclear explosion on their territory in retaliation for an American attack. Now, let me say one additional thing about the submarines that, that I had overlooked. Each of those submarines that would be out there does, in fact, carry enough missiles to destroy every city in the Soviet Union. And in fact, the missiles that they carry can only destroy cities. As I mentioned, they ha do not have hard target kill capability. Now, here's the dilemma that we face with this. If we have lost all of our strategic nuclear retaliatory capability except the submarines, that's all we've got. And the only thing we can hit with them are the cities, and we use those to hit the cities. And remember now, they have not hit the American cities yet. They hit our, they hit our strategic forces. They did not hit our cities. But if we do that, if we attack their cities in retaliation for that, they will destroy every city in America because we cannot destroy their capability for a second strike. They can destroy ours, but we can't destroy theirs for a second strike. That second strike would take us out. I have heard the leading analyst, and I mean the leading analyst, say that no president would ever make that decision. At that point, it is suicide to make that decision. Now, of course, that is a calculated risk. They can't be absolutely sure that President Reagan wouldn't make that decision. Uh, perhaps even the image of two six guns and that sort of thing have, uh, have helped us to this point. I don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a risk that they would have to take. But analysts have openly said, in the open literature, as a matter of fact, that the submarines will never be used. They are a bluff, and the Soviets know it. Well, again, knowing it, yes. Uh, how much faith can they put in it? Well, I don't know. But the point is, it is an extremely dangerous situation. And the last issue of the, of the vulnerability of strategic nuclear forces is hard target kill capability. As I have mentioned, until the MX came online, and we have a few of those now in place in Montana, and uh, until the B-1 came online, we had nothing in our inventory that could destroy the targets, in, these hard targets inside the Soviet Union. I mean, we were technically incapable of doing it. In fact, let me share with you some quotes on that particular subject. From the House Armed Services Committee report of May 10th, 1985, Minuteman, Poseidon, and the bombers are technically incapable of putting at risk the hardened, time-sensitive time -sensitive targets needed to enforce deterrence. Now, that's a shocking statement for a country who relies on mutually assured destruction. It says we can't do it. it does, and the point of technically incapable is very important. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a hawk or a dove, how you think you're going to use them. We do not have the capability of destroying those targets, no matter how we use them. In that same report, it said the following. But now the Soviets have constructed a network of hundreds of underground shelters all over the Soviet Union for nearly every level of Soviet national authorities, both military and civil. Literally, hundreds of thousands of Soviet authorities can be sheltered in this bunker archipelago. Further, these shelters around Moscow are defended by the ABM system. Why have they gone to that immense expense to shelter the Communist Party officials, military officials, and those individuals that are very important to the communist system, particularly in the light of the, uh, of the fact that they have no significant threat against them? They recognize that point. I'll show you a quote to that effect later. Robert Gates, who is currently the deputy director of the CIA, said in November of this past year, the USSR has hardened its ICBM silos 
launch facilities, and key command and control centers to an unprecedented degree. Much of today's U.S. retaliatory force would be ineffective against those hardened targets. Now, why quote Robert Gates? Because he's got access to all of the data. He is an excellent analyst who has access and knows what he is talking about. Does the, uh, does the Strategic Air Command recognize this problem? Let me give you a very recent qu quote from the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Larry Welch, before the Senate Armed Services Committee in February of this year. The inability to destroy hardened Soviet military targets is the greatest shortfall in the Strategic Air Command's operational capability. Again, I emphasize the word inability. That is, that we cannot destroy them. Now, let me briefly indicate to you uh, just uh, one indicator, and there are many, of, uh, of how we got into this particular situation. This shows the deployment of strategic weapon systems by the Soviet Union from 1967 to 19, or from 1960, rather, through 1987 on the top line, and the deployment of strategic weapon systems by the United States during the same period of time on the bottom line. Notice that there is a period of time in here of 20 years in which there was no significant new strategic nuclear weapon systems deployed. That was the same time we were hearing all this business about a nuclear arms race. Believe me, when you have not deployed a strategic nuclear bomber in 30 years and a strategic missile system in 20 years, you're not in a race. We have never been in the race. Notice what the Soviet Union did during that same period of time with treaties like SALT-1, SALT-2, ABM in effect. Here are each one of these missiles represents a class of missiles that they deployed. Right up to the present where last year they deployed 100 of the SS-25s, which is a road mobile missile that is uh, very much uh, like our midget man will be, which we cannot possibly deploy before about 92. And this year they are deploying the SS-24, which is a rail mobile missile like our MX, carrying 10 warheads, having great accuracy and great power. Why in the world are they deploying these two systems when in fact they have an enormous advantage without them? They know we cannot possibly match it for at least another five years, and it's very expensive to deploy those. Well, that set of circumstances has led to where we are now. It extends across the board, however, in, into some other areas. You may have seen last summer, in, in June of 86, because uh, it, it made the headlines of many papers, Jane's Spaceflight Directory, which is the most uh, respected publication of this type that, that uh, publishes the, the uh, various uh, space assets of all the nations and international journals, said the following. The United States is 10 years behind the Soviet space program. The Soviets are so far ahead that they are almost out of sight. The Soviet lead in space is now almost frightening. Now that made headlines in Huntsville, Alabama. I was there working for the uh, U.S. Missile Command uh, last summer. And it made headlines there because, of course, you have NASA uh, Marshall uh, at that location. And there were some who uh, immediately disagreed with that. But I would like to, to uh, uh, share with you a most recent statement from uh, Aviation Week in Space Technology, February of this year, talking about the Soviet space station, which they now have had in orbit over a year. The, as we sit here today, astronauts are up there, cosmonauts are up there, rather, doing their thing. And so about that capability, it says, the new Soviet mission, meaning this space station, represents a significant space endeavor the United States will be unable to match until the mid-1990s. And European scientists have started turning to the Mir's capability. The Mir is the, the name of the space station, by the way. Again, we have not even clearly defined what our space station will look like yet. They have cosmonauts on it. They will have continuous occupancy of that space station uh, till the year 2000, right now. If you actually compare the successful space launches, say over the past eight years, of the United States, of the USSR and United States, and look at the total in the world, you see uh, a staggering figure, again, that most Americans are unaware of. Last year, for example, 1986, the Soviets had 91 successful launches. The United States had six. Of course, that was a particularly low year for us because of the uh, Challenger disaster. There were only a total of 103 launches by all nations in the entire world. Remember, the Europeans had problems, too, with, with, their, uh, with their launcher. And so what that means is 91 out of the total of 103 launches last year were Soviet. That is approximately 90% of all activity in space these days is Soviet Union. Well, last year wasn't just the exception. Notice the year before that, 98 to 17, 97 to 22, 
98 to 23, et cetera. Roughly, they have launched 100 a year, and we've launched 20. Now, let me tell you, they're, they're, it's not that they're launching crude things, and we're launching highly sophisticated things, and therefore it makes up the difference. They're now launching highly sophisticated things also. So the, the, we have gotten ourselves in a great difficulty in regard to space also. Now, let me turn my attention to North American air defense, okay, because that's how we would defend against Soviet bombers. And I would like to give you a very recent quote of the commander of the North American Aerospace uh, Defense System, and he's also commander of Space Command. Those are now joint commands. His name is uh, General John Protowski. Uh, he made this statement April the 16th of this year. North America is a sieve. Any capable Soviet bomber pilot can underfly our radar coverage, whether he be headed for Washington or wherever. It would require no great aviation skill to penetrate our current early warning system. That from the commander of those systems, by the way. Well, let me tell, show you what he's talking about. Also, the NORAD published uh, a comparison of our air defense capabilities with the USSRs. They have 370,000 active duty, full-time personnel devoted to air defense in the Soviet Union, in spite of the fact that they have no major threat in that regard. We have 37,000, in spite of the fact we have a major threat in that regard. Surface-to-air missiles defending their skies. They have 12,000 at, 12, at 1,200 different locations in place. Highly accurate, uh, verified, validated surface-to-air missiles. The United States has zero. I find to my surprise there are many Americans who do not realize that. We do not have a single surface-to-air missile defending the United States and Canada. Interceptors on active duty. That is, those that are available any time. With, again, with virtually no threat, they have 1,200 on active duty. Again, it comes as a startling surprise to most Americans to know that the number of aircraft defending all the United States and Canada is 78. And many of those are the F-106s, a very, very outdated aircraft that could not take on uh, the advanced Soviet uh, bomber capability. Interceptors that are available, if the Russians knew that they were going to launch the attack, they could make available for defending their skies 4,200. If they use another other roles now, could easily make it available. We, with our National Guard units, have 294 for the defense of, of, of all of our country. Warning radars to tell us that they're coming and to uh, direct our interceptors, they have 10,000 in place. We have 100, 50 of which are shared jointly with the Federal Aviation Agency, the FAA. ABM launchers, they have 100. Now, they don't quite have 100 yet. They will complete them in 1988. Most advanced systems in the world, they have, this will be the only operational ABM system in the world around Moscow. They're allowed that, by the way, by the ABM Treaty. We have zero defending Washington or anywhere else. What were the development? The Soviets had begun to send Bear H bombers on training flights that simulate attacks against the North American continent. Now, the point is that only in 85 did they actually start doing that. They had had reconnaissance missions prior to that, but only then did they actually start uh, with actual practice strikes against the continental United States. The commander of NORAD again, April 6th of this year, said the Soviet Tupolev Tu-95 Bar H bombers that routinely fly simulated strike missions within 50 miles of the North American coast are carrying live cruise missiles instead of training with empty bomb bays. Again, when, when we do, we don't do those kind of exercises anymore, but when, if we did those kind of exercises, we do never, never do we use live bombs. In fact, our bombers never take off anymore with live bombs. When they exercise, when the B-52s exercise, if that's a scramble mission when they take off, they download the hydrogen weapons before they take off. We've not had a hydrogen bomb in flight now on a bomber in a long time. And here they are with live cruise missiles, again, from this, this statement from the commander of NORAD at this time. Now, the, the Navy has a responsibility in trying to defend those skies there, too, because the Air Force simply isn't able to carry forth the many requirements that they have. General Ronald Hayes, who's the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Pacific Command, said on May 25th of this year, again, a very recent statement, the new Bear H, operating out of Dolan in central Russia, routinely operates in the Pacific Theater on inter intercontinental simulated strike missions against U.S. targets. Several recent airfield upgrades along the northern coast of the Soviet Union will provide for forward staging or recovery, as well as tanker support operations. In other words, they are upgrading those airfields so that they can support those bomber strikes into the heart of the United States. Uh, why? Again, when they have no threat uh, uh, coming from them 
uh, toward them from the United States. If Mr. Gorbachev is really serious about uh, some of the things he's saying, why does he not simply discontinue that kind of, of development? 